Hello. Okay, welcome, folks. If, if I could have your attention, please. Thank you, first of all, for coming to this panel presentation, panel discussion on the current crisis in Syria. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Jim McDougall. I'm the chairman of the Department of National Security and Strategy. I just joined the team here at the Army War College a couple weeks ago, and I'm very pleased to be here in, in part of the team with you all. Um, at the outset, let me just say thank you to General Kukulo, Ambassador Reed Rowe, Dr. Betros, and Dean of the School of Strategic Land Power, Dr. Lacamont, faculty and staff, and all of you, our strategic leaders of tomorrow, friends and colleagues of the U.S. Army War College for being here today. Uh, in addition, I should say that we have friends and colleagues from Dickinson College and from the Penn State School of Law coming in remotely via video, as well as other interested parties, including some on the Army staff, I'm told. But it is, let me just say to, to set the record straight, an open forum for attribution. So be clear if you have questions to ask or if you make comments, and for us as well, that this is open to the public. It's not our usual, not for attribution setting. So please keep that in mind. I'd like to say at the beginning, particularly an, a word to our U.S. Army War College students here in the audience and maybe by video. It's fortuitous that we have this panel on the day that we start courses, two core courses, first, theory of war and strategy, and second, national security policy and strategy. Much of what we're studying, or much of what we will study in the couple weeks ahead will be borne out in the discussion that you will hear today. In fact, I think it will raise many questions and maybe give you several good ideas on how to approach some of the topics that we'll be studying. As our national security establishment moves towards a decision on how to address the crisis in, theory, in Syria, I'm personally encouraged knowing that some of the people involved in that process, some of your senior colleagues, attended NSPS and TWS, or courses very much like it at other war colleges. I repeat that. I mean, it's comforting and encouraging to know that people have spent at least a year thinking critically and in a concentrated way about not a specific issue, but how to address specific issues from a strategic and policy point of view. I'm confident as you start NSPS in particular, because this, in my mind, how to address the crisis in Syria is very much a national security policy issue, a national security policy decision that we're faced with right now. But I'm confident in saying that every single lesson in the NSPS course will provide you knowledge, background, and skills that would help you address the decision we're making on Syria or a similar decision. In addition, the theory of war and strategy course will provide you the knowledge and skills important to understanding and analyzing a broader context. What our choices are, what our regional and global strategy is, and how these crises and these decisions that we make to address crises fall within a broader strategic perspective. In a couple weeks, all of us together will have a much better, a much more comprehensive understanding of the concentrated intellectual endeavor that is strategy in the dynamic, interactive, and violent phenomenon we know as war. Now, to the title of the panel today, what should the United States do about Syria? And I'd just like to present as a graphic a cartoon from The New Yorker some years ago that came to my mind when we started discussing this panel. And if you take a minute to look at it, you'll see the caption, of course, General Sedgwick is proposing a surgical strike and he's dressed as a surgeon. Now, besides being mildly humorous, it brings a couple things to my mind. First of all, this is a snapshot in time. But we don't know why General Sedgwick is proposing a surgical strike, nor how he got his information that would lead him to that option. We're going to study that in great detail. In other words, what I'm trying to suggest to you, we're not only looking at the what 
of the decision making, but the how and particularly the why. And given that we all have a year here together, it's one of the few times in your career, in our careers, where we can really address the why. Usually it's what, when, and how. That's how we deal with crises. That's how we deal with issues. But we have the luxury and the responsibility of addressing the why. So we might ask, why did General Sedgwick propose this alternative? And lastly, for what I have to say by way of introduction, I'd just like to suggest to you that in the very near future, in the nearest future, when you leave here, many of you will be advising General Sedgwick or whoever's sitting in his chair today. As, as I said, this is an old cartoon. What's more, some years beyond that, some of you, and my best wishes to all, may be sitting in General Sedgwick's chair or one of those other chairs around the table. And what we have to do this year together is prepare collectively and prepare individually to make the best decisions possible using the best skills and knowledge we can provide to make those decisions. Okay, with that I'd like to introduce what is a very esteemed uh, distinguished panel to address this specific issue in Syria. First of all, to the far right, Dr. Larry Goodson. Larry's a professor of Middle Eastern Studies here at the U.S. Army War College and a leading academic specialist on the region as well as Afghanistan and Pakistan. His academic work was done at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's the author of numerous uh, works on the Middle East and the broader Islamic world. He's traveled extensively in the region, lived in Egypt for six years, traveled also to Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Cyprus, and the Gulf countries. So clearly someone on the strength of both his academic and his practical experience on the ground has a deep understanding of the region. Uh, to my immediate right, Dr. W. Andrew Terrell. Andy is a research professor in national security affairs and a Middle East specialist at the Strategic Studies Institute here at the War College. Prior to that, he served eight years as a Middle Eastern nonproliferation analyst at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. He's published a number of monographs with SSI on the Middle East, national security issues, dangers of escalation in limited wars, particularly important in this case. He's also published a number of pieces on chemical weapons in the Middle East. So given his Middle Eastern expertise and understanding of chemical weapons, Andy brings another very acute and important point of view to the, to the discussion. To my immediate left, Dr. Uh, Richard Dick Winslow is a professor of political military affairs at the Center for Strategic Leadership and Development here at the War College since 1996. Did his doctoral work at Georgetown. He's a retired U.S. Army officer. He was a Middle Eastern FAO, foreign area officer, uh, excuse me. Served in Jordan, Yemen, and Bahrain. Served also as a political military planner on the Joint Staff. So he was one of the ones advising General Sedgwick and a director of Middle Eastern Studies at, in the Department of National Security and uh, Strategy. To my far left, Dr. Chris Bowen, professor of National Security Affairs in the Department of Distance Education. Uh, Chris also did his work at Georgetown University. He's also a retired U.S. Army Middle Eastern FAO with service in Egypt, Tunisia, and Jordan. Additionally, in the policymaking sphere, on, while on active duty, Chris served on the National Security Affairs staff of Vice Presidents Gore and Vice Presidents Cheney. So I think you'll see on the academic, on the policymaking, on the technical sides, we have a very broad spectrum of expertise. And with that, it's my pleasure to ask Larry if you'd please present your remarks first. Okay, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, if you'll put the slides back on, or do I do that? Well, they're not To the on. right. Yep. Yeah, but there we go. Okay, uh, as, you, as you saw from the outset, my job is to talk about uh, uh, the policy challenge for the United States. Uh, 
So, and as Jim said, you started out this morning before the fire alarm uh, with your uh, uh, national security policy and strategy course where we talked about policy and strategy. Um, the, the main point I would suggest to you before I go to Syria is that policy is the broad position that a government takes on a particular issue, uh, which it then uses the various tools at its disposal, the diplomatic, informational, military, economic, and other tools, to uh, attempt to achieve uh, its goals with regard to that issue. Strategy, as you all uh, talked about this morning, I'm sure, is the calculated relationship between ends, ways, and means that allows uh, policy goals to be uh, pursued and hopefully achieved. And of course, there's risk associated in, in pursuing one strategy or another. The main point I would suggest to you in this slide, and I think it's, it's terribly uh, significant for uh, the debate on Syria, is that politics sort of drives the policy world. And therefore, the policy world is intrinsically murky, gray, ambiguous, uncertain. I mean, choose whatever particular uh, descriptor you want. Uh, it's almost never the case that we can turn to a particular issue and say with great certainty, this is and has always been our policy in foreign policy with regard to a particular issue. And certainly Syria illustrates that very clearly. Now, uh, in particular, to, uh, you also this morning talked about values and interests, perhaps, in many of the classes. Uh, I thought I would uh, illustrate uh, a particular problem in the policy world which is the problem of balancing values and interests in U.S. foreign policy. So I took the four main uh, goals that are articulated in President Obama's 2010 National Security Strategy. There they are. Respect universal values, lead a peaceful and cooperative world order, ensure U.S. security, and maintain economic prosperity. And I categorized them all by myself, the president didn't do this, uh, into the categories of values and interests, where I thought they more, uh, more carefully, or more uh, correctly, rather, uh, uh, fit. Uh, and the problem we often find, it doesn't always exist, but I want you to keep it in mind, because I'm going to go to the president's words on Syria here in a moment, is that values and interests are sometimes in tension uh, in our foreign policy. Um, and so, if you listened to the president's speech last night, and I'm sure many of, many of you did, uh, he talked specifically about the values that are at stake uh, in regard to uh, the use of chemical weapons in Syria. He also talked about U.S. national security interests that are at stake uh, in Syria. Perhaps he made a compelling case or not uh, to you, but, uh, but he tried to articulate both. But what I'm suggesting to you is that frequently they are at tension with each other. Now, another point. Sometimes there is tension within the interest and within the values uh, with, uh, uh, between several interests. These are the six core U.S. interests, to use the president's language, in the Middle East as he articulated in his speech at the State Department in May of 2011, countering terrorism, stopping the spread of nuclear weapons, which you could perhaps extend to also apply to uh, uh, other weapons of mass destruction that are you know, not nuclear, uh, securing the free flow of commerce, which is sort of code language for uh, the free flow of oil, safeguarding the security of the region, standing up for Israel's security and pursuing Arab-Israeli peace. I mean, these are, these are the ones that have been articulated in one form or another by president after president after president, uh, 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 for the most part, anyway, these have been articulated uh, repeatedly. So these are relatively enduring interests, but these are broad interests. How do these interests come to bear in a case like Syria? Now, I don't know if you can read this, but this is the president's statement about uh, Syria. I guess you can read it, maybe. Um, uh, his radio address on, seven, on uh, September 7th, all right? I put that in, uh, and instead of the uh, statement he, he made last night, I mean, I, I left that in. I was about to change it, but I decided to leave it in because 
I think it illustrates in a very short passage uh, the points I've just been making. You see there in the red type, this was not only a direct attack on human dignity, it is a serious threat to our national security. He said in slightly different words the same thing last night. So its value and its interest that's at play uh, in Syria. And then, just as a, a coming attraction for all the students in the room that are going to come to this in the next few weeks, look at the other bits of uh, red ink there. That's why last weekend I announced that as Commander-in-Chief, I decided that the United States should take military action against the Syrian regime. Oh, okay. Uh, what's that? Article 2 uh, or of the Constitution that, uh, that uh, sets forth uh, the presidency? And what, what about down at the bottom? That's why I asked members of Congress to debate this issue and vote on authorizing the use of force. So we have both, uh, both the, the section of the Constitution dealing with the, uh, the Congress, the section of the Constitution dealing with the presidency, and the, the, the division of who has the power to decide about uh, matters of war and foreign policy, uh, in, uh, uh, all articulated in a brief passage of the President's statement about what to do uh, in Syria. Finally, uh, because I promised to be brief, this will be the one and only time for my students that are in the room that I'm ever going to do this. Uh, finally, I wanted to reach back without you know, violating non-attribution to an earlier speaker that some of you heard in noontime lecture not too long ago who suggested to you that Syria posed a policy challenge and a strategy challenge between terrible and awful. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing what the, the speaker said. That is the policy challenge that is there, and it's especially there because how do you balance values, which are very important to Americans, probably to all countries, but especially to a country that holds itself as the leader of the international order, uh, and a country that has claimed that there are universal values that it stands for, so values are important. We can't just say, oh, that's not in our interest, good luck. Uh, except, of course, we do from time to time, like all countries do. But how do you balance values uh, when they uh, run counter to interest? Where do you come down on that? And then if you decide, well, we have to do something to, uh, uh, to get the chemical weapons out of the hands of the Syrian regime, uh, what strategy do you then uh, pursue? Uh, all of this is made more complex. Jim introduced all of this by sort of highlighting the linkages to the two courses that you folks are, uh, most of you folks are, are in right now. I'd add one more. The regional courses that are coming at the, uh, a little bit later in the year uh, also will hopefully highlight for you the, the, the sort of the details to the complexity in different parts of the world. And so now that I have talked a little bit about what you have already heard about in your previous course as, I think, a complex, ill-structured problem or a wicked problem you might have heard about, right, that these are problems that are peculiarly resistant to being uh, uh, resolved, uh, I'm now going to get out of the way and turn it over to the people that are going to flesh out the complexity uh, of the region and the strategy options available to us. So, Andy, over to you. Thank you, Larry. Okay. Um, as you probably read in the program, I'm going to be talking about um, Syrian internal politics and the internal situation there. And of course, when you're looking at the Bashar Assad government, uh, there's something that they used to say about the Russian government. It's very opaque. Decision-making is very opaque. So, yeah, one of the analogies that has sometimes been used is that uh, it's like sharks fighting underwater. The only way you actually know what happens is one floats to the top dead. So, that kind of a closed system uh, is, presents some challenges to look at domestic politics. Also, as many of you have been in countries where there are not free presses, where there is no freedom of the press, 
you probably all had a reasonably good chance to experience how dramatically the rumor mill tries to fill in that gap. Because people want to know what's going on. They don't get it from the press. All of a sudden, they're getting it from the rumor mill. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of, of, of different aspects of the internal politics of Syria. And I'm going to sort of say, uh, at various points in time, some of this information is a little uncertain. But um, this is what we know. And, and that's the important thing. Um, this, however, that you're looking at now is certain. It's the why, we, why nobody from the outside can fix Syria slide for shorthand. Because this is a mosaic of a country. And it's a country with the demographic distribution of different Islamic sects and different ethnic groups has made a huge difference in how that country has been governed and how people look at politics. Uh, bear with me a little bit on, on, the, on the numbers because they're really, really important. But about maybe 63% of Syria, and you can see the region in the yellow, are Sunni Muslims, Sunni Arab Muslims. You also have Sunni Kurdish Muslims, but that's a little different story. The Sunnis are that same sect that we see in many Arab countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, um, all of the Gulf countries. They're the, they're the majority there. And they are also the majority in Syria. But they are not in power in Syria. The people who are in power or the regime is composed primarily of such people are the Alawites. The Alawites are only 8 to 10 percent, maybe 12 percent at the, oh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the outlier, but no more than 12 percent. So they're a fairly small number of people proportionally to the Sunnis. And then you have a lot of other minorities in, in, in uh, Syria. This is not Saudi Arabia, we're pretty monolithic. But you have a lot of Christians. You have over 2 million Christians, probably about 2,300,000 Christians. And uh, if you've been to Damascus, as I have, you run into a lot of them pretty quickly because they, a lot of them tend to be in some of the urban areas. So this is a very diverse country. Some of the smaller minorities, Druze, Kurds, etc., you see. And you see that there's little bits of enclaves, too, things like that. So um, this is a very much a mosaic of a country. So why then are people who may be no more than 8% of the population, why are they dominant? And who are they? You know, if you're going to ask what somebody's going to do, a really good question to start with is, who are they? And um, the Alawites are basically people who throughout the majority of Syria's history have been at the bottom rung of the, of the socioeconomic ladder. These are the people that had the really crummy jobs. These are the people that were the sharecroppers. These were people who were sending their daughters, for the most part, to be domestic servants in other households. In the Ottoman times, to do that is simply to be a slave almost. So you've got people that have had a very difficult time throughout most of Syria's history, and yet they're on top. Well, that's, that's an interesting situation because what put them on top is we had a history of colonialism in the Middle East, and France was the colonial power that had the greatest interest in Syria and had the League of Nations mandate controlling Syria after the Ottoman Empire was broken up after World War I. France had been very interested in the Catholic community uh, in Syria and sort of their protector for decades, for decades, for centuries, actually, at that point in time. So then the French had to think, okay, we're in charge, how are we going to rule this? Well, we don't want to deploy French military units from France. We need local auxiliaries. Who are we going to choose? Well, let's choose minority groups 
because the minority groups probably have at, at the very least mixed feelings about independence because they don't know in an independent Syria how long their rights are going to be respected by the majority. Likewise, the Alawites thought it was a wonderful job to join the army because um, you had a lot more opportunity than you did in any other field for them that was open to them. So you saw this, this not just Alawites, but certainly a number of Alawites um, find themselves into the colonial military forces. Now, when Syria became independent in 1946, they had a sizable presence in the military that was left behind, as did other minorities, the, the Druze especially, to a lesser extent the Christians. But over time, the Alawites outmaneuvered them. By 1966, you had Alawite government. By 1970, November 1970, you had the first Assad regime under Hafez Assad, Bashir's father. They're in the interesting situation now where as you look at the Syrians, you have to ask why, are, why is the government and its supporters fighting so hard? Why is it so bitter? And a big part of why it is so bitter is because the Alawites who are basically dominating this regime don't ever want to go back to the bad old days when they were at the very bottom of Syrian society. Nor do they want to pay that extra interest of 43 years of misrule by the Assad family. There's a lot of revenge being tacked on to all of the traditional prejudices against Alawites. And so the Alawites fight like it's a zero-sum game. The Alawites fight like the alternative is genocide. The Alawites fight because they absolutely fear to death a majoritarian government where they will have absolutely no rights in the aftermath of Assad uh, falling. Christians, likewise, and as I said, there's a lot of Christians, and many of the other minorities are on the fence, or they lean towards the regime. They'll make some cos cosmetic gestures towards the opposition, but the Christians especially are terrified an Islamist regime is going to, um, is going to replace Assad, and they're going to suffer the same fate as the um, Iraqi Christian community after Saddam left, except they're going to suffer it in spades. So you've got a lot of people fighting very hard to stay in power. This is, this is, this is a certain level of bitterness, and people are not easily going to give up. Likewise, on the other side of the, of the equation, you have the motivations for the rebellion. The rebellion started in March 2011 as part of the Arab Spring. After Tunisia lost its dictator and, and Hosni Mubarak was ousted in Egypt, um, they said, well, Ben Ali's gone and Mubarak's gone, why not Assad? And so this was part of the euphoria that, um, that, that, uh, that was characterized that, those times before the backlash took in. And originally, the demonstrations against Assad were just that. They were demonstrations. This wasn't violent. And of course, with any kind of a dictator that rules by fear, you, um, you absolutely have to ensure that people stay afraid. And that's when the massive brutality broke out. Uh, it broke out. And you can see right down at the bottom, there's a little city named Dera. I've been there. Um, that's where Lawrence of Arabia had a few problems, if, for those of you who have seen that movie with the Turkish governor. Um, but Dera is uh, where the, the problems started to break out. And uh, part of it was because some kids wrote on the wall, the people are against the regime. These are kids. And they got picked up, um, imprisoned, beaten, I don't know when the line between beaten 
crosses over to torture, but they're certainly getting there. And this kind of brutal, um, just uh, absolutely merciless approach to things offended a lot more people than it, um, than it, uh, it cowed in these, in, in these particular times. So you had then, um, as the government unleashed its response, people didn't back down. You started to see people pick up guns, pick up rifles. And of course now, fast forward over two years later, we have a whole mosaic of different groups. We have two Al-Qaeda affiliates. Uh, we have a variety of, of other Islamist groups. And then we have um, groups like the Free Syrian Army who, who look pretty good to us compared to the others. And these groups are the groups that are now waging war against Assad. Secretary Kerry said a few days ago that 15 to 20 percent of them were considered extremists. That's maybe as good a guess as any, but I think it has to be a guess. I, 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 I can't imagine that you can get very accurate information on something like that. And um, one of the other problems, too, is that, uh, as you know, as we're looking at the different groups, these various groups, you have to ask yourself, if you were a Syrian field commander in the opposition, what would you want to do? Would you want to work together with the other groups in one big unified campaign? Or would you want to have 30 different groups fighting 30 different wars with no coordination? I think the military expertise in this, uh, in this group is uh, such that that latter one doesn't appeal to too many people. So we have seen this kind of blurring of lines, I believe. But um, it, it's something that, uh, that we're you know, continuing to try to cope with. And it's, as we watch the opposition, and uh, we're you know, trying to come up with policies, but I do sympathize that it's, it's hard to come up with policies that can support one group and keep them completely separate from, from the other groups. Um, OK. So the other thing I want to, and I'm having to make some points fast, and I better make them very fast, is that um, you also are in a situation where there's now enough different groups with different agendas in Syria that after Assad is killed, if he is killed, he could be crucified in the center square of Damascus tomorrow, and they're still going to be fighting in Syria. It's just going to go into different phases. Okay. I am exceeding my time, so let me make a couple of other real quick points, and then I'll move on. This is my last slide. It's on the chemical weapons. And basically what you see is the chemical weapons uh, program of Hafez Assad and Bashar Assad both has gone on since the 1970s. And it was especially serious after Egypt signed a separate peace accord with Israel because the Israelis were known or certainly widely believed throughout the Arab world to have nuclear weapons and the uh, Syrians were looking for something that uh, could, uh, could deter uh, or threaten the Israelis in a way that uh, would be meaningful after they'd lost their greatest ally, Egypt. So we have then a big, big program there that's well integrated into the military and is very, very interesting uh, uh, to... Um, to uh, to Assad as he looks at how he's going to cope with his present problems. Because right now he's fighting people without any kinds of protective equipment, without any masks, without anything that's going to protect them. If you use something like, which he did use, uh, 122 millimeter MRL, multiple rocket launcher, fire missiles into these areas, you do that in conjunction with, co with conventional artillery, people are going to go to basements to try and get away from the conventional artillery, sarin is heavier than air, so it gets them in the basement. You can kill a lot of, of unprotected people with something like this. It's a real temptation to him. The thing I think he was doing was what President Nasser did if, when he used chemical weapons in the Yemen, what Saddam Hussein did when he 
use chemical weapons against the Iranians. You start out with one attack, you hit hard, you sit back. And when you sit back, you see what happens next. If the world throws a fit over what you've just done, you back off. If the world doesn't care, you use more. And so those sorts of things are, um, are, are on his mind when you look at Syrian decision making. Last thing I'm going to say on Syrian decision making and escalation, and I can say a lot more of this, but someone's going to kick me under the table, um, is that Assad is not an irrational person. Always you hear talk about, oh, these dictators are all irrational. He's like Hitler in the last 10 days in the bunker. That's not the case. He's completely rational from everything we've seen. And he's not a hothead. His brother, who used to be the number two in the regime, was a hothead. But I haven't seen him, no one's seen him, in public for 14 months. He's either dead or so badly crippled he can no longer function uh, in the government. So I don't see Assad getting so angry he decides to play a game up the escalation ladder with the United States. That's not his style, but, um, but we'll have to continue to watch this. And I think I better yield my time now. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Yeah. Dick, please. All right, thank you. Uh, Larry framed this in terms of a very complex problem, and Andy has laid out the first layer of that complexity, which is the internal nature of, of Syria and in some detail. Uh, but he could go on for a very long time, and we would be filling details uh, not only the rest of this afternoon, but all day tomorrow as well. Uh, so we're not going to do that. So I'm going to shift to the next level of complexity, which is the region and the international stage more broadly. And uh, when we look at the map, the first thing that strikes us is Syria is not an island. Syria is in the heart of the Middle East. And because it's in the heart of the Middle East, it is what happens in Syria connects to other things in the Middle East. And that is especially so because if we went back to the map that Andy had of the ethnic distribution within Syria, and we did a slightly different version of that map, which didn't stop at the borders, but carried the ethnic groups over the borders into neighboring countries, we would see that you know, the Druze in Syria are also to a small degree in Jordan, but especially in Lebanon and Israel. The Alawis extend up into Turkey. The Kurds extend up into Turkey and to the east into Iraq. So all of these groups that Andy talked about with the, uh, that add to the complexity of the situation inside of Syria extend in, into other countries. And that means that those other countries have to care about what's going on. And so what I'm going to do next is talk very briefly about the actors. Now, this list that I've put up is by no means inclusive. It is representative. The only one that's inclusive is the first category of immediate neighbors. Those are the five contiguous neighbors of Syria, they share borders, and as, as I've already said, they share ethnic groups across the borders or sectarian groups across the borders. So they care intensely, but they also care for another reason, which I'm going to come back to, and that is what's going on in S Syria spills over the borders onto their territory. Uh, so I'm only gonna talk about one of them right now, that's Lebanon, and very briefly, uh, just to illustrate the point uh, of this spillover. And th that is that in Lebanon, because groups share identity with groups in Syria, sometimes down to family level, uh, the violence in Syria has spread into Lebanon. Now, right now that's abated somewhat, uh, but it has gone up and down since the Syrian civil war started. And it will continue. I'm confident of that. Okay. So that's, what, that's just to illustrate the point. But each of the immediate neighbors has some problem like that, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, the next group I want to talk about very briefly are the supporters of the regime. And uh, Larry pointed out in his presentation 
that the United States, you know, we engage internationally based both on our values and on our interests. Well, so do other countries, okay? And for each of these other countries, I mean, you can, you can look at Iran and you can make a values-based argument for why Iran does what it does. Iran views itself as the leader of Shia Islam. Therefore, Iran protects other Shia regimes. Therefore, it protects Syria. Okay? You can look at Hezbollah and you can make an interest-based argument. Not only are they fellow Shiites, but for Hezbollah, Syria is an important ally because Hezbollah's most important supporter is Iran, and most Iranian support, especially in the form of weapons flows, flows through Syria. So Hezbollah has a very pragmatic, interest-based reason for supporting Syria, which is to continue the flow of Iranian support that goes on through Syria. Okay? It's self-interested. Okay? You can do that for each of these countries. For each one, you can say, okay, what are their interest-based, pragmatic reasons for aligning the way they do? What are their ideally idealist-based reasons for doing what they do? Again, I'm just trying to illustrate one or two of the others. For the regional supporters of the opposition, again, we could use Saudi Arabia as an example. Uh, it, is, it views itself as the leader of the Sunni Arab world. Uh, as the leader of the Sunni Arab world, it has an interest in maintaining its prestige, in maintaining its influence, and spreading its view of uh, what the world should look like. It also has a very pragmatic interest in opposing Iran, because Iran and Saudi Arabia, in many ways, are locked in a very high-level dispute over who's going to lead in their region. And again, they neighbor each other across the Arab or Persian Gulf, depending on what you want to call it. Okay. And then we have international actors. Uh, five of those, the United Kingdom, the United States, Russia, China, and France, are the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Okay. As permanent members, they each wield a veto, and that, as we get into subsequent discussion, is going to become a very critical thing to think about, uh, because if we try to go forward on the issue of eliminating uh, serious chemical weapons through the diplomatic effort of the following up on the Russian proposal that they will this disarm and adhere to the chemical weapons condition, the only way to give that teeth in the eyes of many is through action in the UN Security Council. And that any action in the UN Security Council requires the cooperation or at least the acquiescence of the five permanent members. Okay, So that's going to be a major hurdle. Uh, now, this is complicated because the UK, France, the United States, all back the, the opposition to the Hafez al-Assad, I'm sorry, the Bashar al-Assad regime. Uh, whereas China and Russia back the regime. Okay, So we have built-in tension at the level of the Security Council that's going to make this very hard to deal with. Uh, so having said that, I'm going to move on but I do want to make the point at the bottom, each country is uniquely situated and each one has to be thought about individually. That's important. I group these for convenience so that uh, we could discuss them, uh, but we don't want to generalize. We don't want to think that all five of the immediate neighbors have the same cut on what's going on in Syria. They each have their own unique view and we need to understand each of those views. So let me move on uh, to regional effects. And the, the term that we hear in the press is spillover. Okay? The Syrian civil war is spilling over 
to the neighbors. And so, so it's worthwhile to think about, uh, well, what form does that spillover take? And there, there are three primary forms. Uh, the first is refugees. Uh, there are over two million refugees uh, at present. That number has grown dramatically uh, in the last six months. Uh, and refugees present a problem. Uh, they are a burden on the host governments. Now, the primary hosts right now are Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan. Each of them hosts a different number, it's, uh, but for Turkey, uh, my assessment at present, it's still a, manage a manageable problem, okay? in part because of Turkey's size and the strength of its economy. For Jordan and Lebanon, they are not nearly as fortunate. The number of refugees are approaching the point where they actually challenge the physical infrastructure of the country. I mean, Jordan faces a challenge of water deprivation. I mean, Jordan has a problem without the Syrian refugees of providing adequate water resources for its own population. It is now trying to provide adequate water to an additional 600,000 people, at least 600,000 people, maybe more. Uh, so it's a, ch it's a challenge just to do basic support to humanity to provide things as simple as drinking water. Okay? The international organizations and non-governmental organizations that support refugee populations are also challenged in supporting this number of refugees. Two million refugees is a huge challenge for the international community. So that's one challenge. Again, the uh, Lebanon and Jordan, it is much more serious than for Turkey on, on the relative scale of the problem. But for all three, it is significant. Then there is the issue of violence. I al already alluded to the in, situation in Lebanon. Uh, the violence has spread across the border. Uh, there has been fighting in Lebanon between Shia and Sunni factions based on whom within Syria those factions have been supporting. So that's, that's direct spillover. There has been uh, instances in, uh, of Israel defending its interests and conducting military operations, which they have neither confirmed nor denied, uh, to eliminate uh, what they probably believed were, was the movement of dangerous munitions into the hands of Hezbollah in Lebanon. So Israel has taken action when it is, uh, or is believed to have taken action when it, they deem it's been appropriate uh, to defend itself. So that's another form that we're seeing violence. And then we have seen in Turkey and Iraq, we have seen instances which thus far have been relatively minor, uh, where uh, in Turkey there was an instance of Syrian artillery fire into a Turkish town on, uh, that took place uh, seven to eight months ago. Uh, in uh, Iraq, there have been instances of uh, groups that thought they had sought refuge successfully in Iraq being attacked within Iraq. Uh, so uh, different manifestations of violence. Uh, and then there is the issue of uh, Syria as a haven for violent extremist organizations. Uh, we see that that is a large part of the, the debate right now uh, about the nature of the opposition. Uh, is it primarily Al-Qaeda? Is it some Al-Qaeda? How deeply is Al-Qaeda embedded? Uh, is that a problem for us? Is that not a problem? Uh, but it's very clear that Syria has become a haven. And then the last one, talking not quite in the order in the slide, is this issue of sanctuary. Uh, at some point, even though this has not yet manifested itself, uh, I believe that the Syrian regime, as the civil war goes on, will become frustrated 
with Jordan and Turkey in particular, with the fact that Jordan and Turkey are allowing the flow of arms to, to opposition groups uh, through their territory, and that the Syrian regime will be tempted to strike out against Turkey and Jordan uh, to stop that flow or reduce it. Uh, far more likely that they will pick on Jordan than on Turkey, simply because of the relative size and power of those two countries. Uh, but distinctly a possibility. So I listed this issue of sanctuary and the reaction to sanctuary as an issue, even though we have not yet seen it manifested. One more. So finally, uh, again, going back to Larry's theme of the complexity and what we need to understand uh, to deal with this, is we have to recognize that just as we in the United States are trying to figure out what our interests are and whether or not we should be acting, every other country that has a stake in Syria is also trying to figure out what its national interests are and whether or not they need to act. And alluding to what Andy said about uh, this issue of the rumor mill in the region, uh, it's not only their interests, but it's their perception of the situation. It's not our perception, it's not our interest, it's theirs. Okay? So part of what we have to do is we have to make the effort to understand each of those other invested countries' interests and perceptions so that when we try to bring them into a coalition or we decide that they're not with them, and we want to isolate them, we do it wisely based on knowledge, not doing it foolishly based on ignorance. And with that, I will pass to Chris. Okay, my charge is kind of to talk about strategy. And, uh, you know, as luck would have it, I mean, uh, we've got an ideal opportunity here. Syria provides a real, in real time, very visible example of how strategy is developed. But you need to have a way to think about how strategies developed. The model here is, provides that kind of analytical framework. Um, two things. I mean, one, and I'm going to walk through kind of my application of this model to where the current administration policy and strategy is with respect to Syria, and identify what I consider kind of the key, uh, the key holes as well, as well as where President Obama and others have kind of filled in those gaps. Um, but you also need to be debating as you go through and talk about this and attempt to apply the model to what you're seeing in the real world, what, where the real world departs from theory, where are the constraints, um, how is it really different from what's depicted here in the model. And I'll just uh, bring up two things just to get us started. Uh, one, I'd say, I mean, in reality, there are absolutely no firm lines in this model. If you were going to develop in this and really portray it a little more accurately, each of those elements would be kind of a perforated cloud and you'd have influence arrows going in and out of every possible a combination of either global influences, domestic influences, or the process of strategy formulation that takes place inside there, but it's too complicated to do that, right? But simple example, is Congress quite literally going to have a vote on this strategy? I mean, they could quite literally pull the plug on a military option, the military concept for employing the military instrument of power. So that's got a big influence. International law, obviously having a huge impact. I mean, arguably, that's one of the primary drivers for President Obama in dealing with this situation and the way that he thinks it ought to be dealt with. And then, of course, that international law, though different aspects of that, will actually have an impact on who's going to join our alliance or coalition or not. And that's why there will be a push to get UN Security Council, you know, resolution um, and back, backing for this diplomatic effort that goes through. They'll try and put in some, you know, firm uh, hard lines in terms of if Syria doesn't comply, what are the consequences? And, you know, so you see that's a really interactive um, process and reality. But let me briefly sketch out kind of how I would apply current administration strategy according to this model, and we can uh, debate it afterwards. 
um, national purpose in terms of enduring beliefs, ethics, and values. I mean, that was the president's pitch last night. It, you know, it just listened to him, and he talks about how he was emotionally impacted by watching the videos. He encouraged everybody who's got a vote in this matter to actually watch those videos for that emotional impact. And that's something that I think in particular our elected leaders, I can tell you from two different administrations, they all feel intensely the moral burden of their decision making, both on what they do, what they don't do, whether they imply and involve and employ military forces or not. So they all feel that weight intensely, whereas us as advisors actually don't necessarily um, you know, feel that impact because it's not our responsibility. And we have a tendency to think about things and present things a little bit more in rational terms. So that's one key you know, element. But I think he's, he's got that piece down. Um, he, he did assert that not given our values, not responding forcefully to the use of chemical weapons in Syria would actually negatively impact our interest. Um, I actually think he's got a much bigger job in terms of selling that to the American people, because if you watch commentary both before and after his speech, a lot of the criticism from folks is, I still don't see the connection to Syria to direct U.S. American national interest. So he's still got a, he's, if I were advising him, I'd say we got some work to do here, boss, and this is where we got to move forward. And I can flush that out hopefully a little bit uh, toward the end. National policy, similarly kind of squishy, but it appears like, well, our policy is going to be we're going to take forceful action in response to any use of chemical weapons. Um, it's a little bit squishier than I'm comfortable with, but I think that's kind of where we're at. Where he gets a little bit uh, more in detail and kind of we can get some insights from the model, I think, in terms of the national objectives. And he's actually laid the national obje objectives out very directly in his speech. He said the purpose of this strike, and particularly he's referring to the military application of power here, would be to one, deter Assad from using chemical weapons, two, degrade his regime's ability to use them, and three, make clear to the world that we will not tolerate their use. So those objectives, you know, are out there. So those are the strategic ends that the strategy ought to be aimed at accomplishing it. I think if you take a look at the administration, you've got the strategic concepts. How are we going to employ the full range of the nation's instruments of military power? The administration, I think, would argue, look, we've tried the diplomatic route. We actually encouraged and organized the conference in Geneva where you know, representatives of the regime and the opposition met. That's one you know, track toward a political diplomatic solution that we had in track. Uh, so that was Geneva 1. Uh, Geneva II just hasn't happened for a host of reasons. Uh, they've also pursued a kind of a diplomatic track with the opposition, working with them to forge a more unified, effective opposition at the diplomatic political level. That's another track. Third, I think another track was his laying out the red line. I mean, that was a diplomatic effort to prevent what ultimately happened was the use of chemical weapons. And that's what's arguably put his credibility on the line, and I think that's something worth talking about later. I'm a little bit skeptical about that piece of the argument, um, but that's something where, you know, there's some debate. And the real significance of this either proposal that was kind of advanced, maybe ad hoc by Secretary of State Kerry in terms of getting Syria to voluntarily um, disarm and get rid of their chemical weapons stockpiles. Uh, that's another diplomatic approach that's taken on a life of its own, and I think is actually the U.S. government is actually right in pursuing this one. There are a lot of obstacles. Uh, there's certainly no guarantee that it'll lead to a successful resolution. There are certainly some risks associated with it, but I think overall, I mean, that's a track that's worth uh, uh, seeing if, uh, if there's any legs to it, and the administration, I think, is, is right in pursuing that. So that's diplomacy. On the information side, that's what the last two weeks has all been about. I mean, you know, President Obama was at the G20 meeting, having sidebar conversations with all key leaders of the world and attempting to get their support for a military strike at the time. Um, kind of weak, mixed results on that score. Four other countries have signed up to the use of military force. About 11 have said, yeah, there ought to be strong action. They signed a resolution. 
but unfortunately you've got a whole host of other folks led by uh, Russia, Iran, China, and others who were, you know, in opposition. But that's the international side of it. And last night was all about drumming up domestic support. So that information campaign is ongoing, and I think you'll continue to see that played out. Economically, we've kind of pulled both triggers. We've, you know, done the typical employee sanctions. That's the negative economic instrument of power, employee sanctions against the Syrian regime. Um, we've got limited leverage there, frankly, because we're just not a huge trading partner. The key there will be getting multilateral support for larger range of sanctions if this diplomatic track doesn't pan out. And then we've also done kind of the positive aspect of it in terms of uh, advancing humanitarian assistance to the refugees who are scattered now uh, throughout the region and trying to help Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and others kind of uh, uh, deal with that burden. And then lastly, of course, is the military arm. And the other thing besides the president's speech I'd really encourage you to read and study is the chairman's letter to the Senate Armed Services Committee of this state. I mean, he, I think, really did just a masterful job. And remember, this is in July. This is before the president's speech. He had no statement of national purpose, no clear statement of national interest, no clear statement of what the national objectives were, and yet he went ahead and he laid out in detail the possible military courses of action. He doesn't use the words ends or objectives. He uses the word like impact, but essentially... That's what a proper military objective for this course of action, this use of the military instrument of power would be. He lays out the means, the resources, what it's going to cost in terms of equipment, personnel, and financial dollars for each of these courses of action. And he also talks about the risk associated with each of those courses of military action. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. I think he just did a great job, and he does a wonderful job of providing context for the Congress in this too. He's laying out, hey, look, I'm telling you as a military advisor, my personal judgment, this isn't the representation or position of the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff, my personal professional judgment on what the military options are that could, and his underlines are his, could be used. The issue of whether should belongs to the civilian leadership. And I think that was, that was just great to put it exactly in the right context. Um, and he also follows up with this and kind of as the letter closes, but lays out a, a couple of great insights, I think, in terms of strategy formulation. One, put this again in context. The military is the, uh, is the only instrument of power I'm talking about. It's the job of the president's national security staff and others to actually integrate all those other instruments of national power. So we've got one narrow slice. B, we can accomplish the narrow military objective set out, degrade and deter. We can do that, boss. Got it. But, and here he starts to lay out what some potential risk might be. We can change that balance of power, but at great strategic risk. If we, we learn this from Iraq and Afghanistan, if we don't have a political plan or a plan to prevent the collapse of the state institutions, we risk a failed state which could actually empower the folks that we're fighting against. We, that could empower Al-Qaeda, could empower Al-Nusra and all those affiliates, um, and could actually disperse those chemical weapons that we seek to control and get a handle on. So those are kind of the key strategic risks he lays out. And then lastly, you know, and you study Clausewitz, but there's always friction, there's always uncertainty in war. You have to think through the second, third order effects. What is Iran going to do? What's Russia going to do? And the one thing that's probably most certain is that if we get involved here, we're likely to get deeper involved. Because once you're in, you're in. Uh, my big critique here, and I'll close, I mean, I, I think, again, the gap is the president and his votes have to convince votes how, in particular, military action is going to advance the national interest. Larry Dent laid out the regional interest that the president himself established. Um, first one, counterterrorism. There's a real risk that if you take military action, this is a zero-sum game inside of Syria. If you um, take out or weaken Assad, you're 
because it's a zero-sum game, you're going to necessarily empower the opposition, and that includes elements of Al-Qaeda, et cetera. Um, two, in terms of nuclear weapons, the president's made a case that failure to deter here could lead to, you know, Iran uh, concluding that they can and, you know, can should move forward with a nuclear weapons program. Um, I think there's at least every bit as chance that a military strike in particular would cause Iranian, in particular, the hardliners to reach the opposite conclusion that, hey, look, America, again, has launched military action in the region, and we need a nuclear deterrent to make sure that doesn't happen to us. Um, commerce, there's little issue about commerce here. We don't have a huge amount of trade with Syria, and they're, they're not big players in uh, oil and gas, although they do have some. Security in the region, he probably has a uh, pretty good argument. Um, but the risk there, of course, is what if deterrence doesn't work? and he uses it again, then you're on this inevitable escalatory ladder to future action. In Israel's security, I'd just say, I mean, in reality, um, you know, Israel's pretty agnostic about a military strike, too. Their worst nightmare scenario is that failed state that the chairman warns about, um, where al-Nusra and al-Qaeda will have access to chemical weapons, um, and that's probably their worst-case scenario. So, um, arguably, a military strike doesn't advance that, those interests. So with that, why don't I close? Hopefully that's plenty to get the discussion started. Thanks, Chris, and, and thanks to everybody. Um, just uh, for the sake of order, what I'd like to do, I want to make a couple of comments to wrap this up and then ask for questions. We'll take questions from the audience. You know that there are microphones at every second seat in front of you. Uh, please press the, the button on the microphone and hold it down when you ask your question so we'll ensure that it, it reaches our folks who are coming in on video. Uh, secondly, we'll take some questions from our uh, friends and colleagues outside the building off the monitor here, and I'll sprinkle one of those in from time to time. Oh, for, yeah. um, I just want to make uh, two comments. First is, um, Larry, as most of the panelists have mentioned, very well summed up the uh, oftentimes tension between values and interests. And I wanted to cite last night, you heard the president say that 98% of humanity agrees with the norm against the use of chemical weapons. Now, for the record, there is a Chemical Weapons Convention, an international treaty signed in the 90s, and all but five countries in the world have signed it. That represents the 98%. The five who haven't are, not surprisingly, Syria, North Korea, Angola, South Sudan, and Egypt. So Syria has not signed that convention. So if you're talking about international law, Syria opted not to take part in that. So the question is, everything in the convention, for instance, it says if you are attacked or threatened with attack of chemical weapons, you can appeal to the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, an international organization, for support and help. Well, we're talking about a sub-state group in Syria who may have been victimized or who apparently was victimized with chemical weapons. So they have no recourse under what is an international treaty of states. So that's one problem. Now, the second issue is responsibility to protect. And we'll hear more about it, but this is a norm that has grown increasingly pertinent, I would say. It's described in the UN Charter. There's a resolution, I believe, from 2007 of UN countries talking about the responsibility to protect innocent civilians and others who can't protect themselves. In the 2010 National Security Strategy, you'll find a paragraph on responsibility to protect, how it is in the U.S. interest to support that norm. Now, of course, in most cases of international law, it doesn't say how. Do you go back to the U.N.? Do you, as the, the panelists talked about, work through the Security Council? The how is not really clear, but there is a tension there. My last point, and then we'll take questions, is we now have a Russian proposal, and feel free to ask if you have questions on that. We didn't go into it in detail, but all the panelists have thought through it and have some materials on that. But I bring your attention to a report in March of 2012. The Pentagon was asked, what would it take to secure Syrians' chemical weapons stockpiles? And the answer was 75,000 troops. So I just want everyone to have in the back of their mind 
we're moving from one potential option, which was limited strikes as we understood it, to perhaps a different option, which is some sort of international control over the chemical weapon stockpiles. But again, go back to the map that I think Andy put out. Where are these chemical weapon stockpiles? Half, at least, are in areas that the regime may not even control. Half are in, con or another quarter in contested areas. So they have to be secured. And it's one thing to say this is going to be under international control, but what does that mean in practical terms for all of us in the room? And I don't just mean the U.S., but from all the countries. So again, it's something we have to consider as we, we look at the options. I mean, just thinking about an option doesn't really free us from the responsibility of thinking all the way through it. And what does that mean in terms of, you know, broader policy and, and budgetary issues? Okay. With that, again, thanks to the panel, and I'll, I'll be happy to uh, call on a question if I see a hand somewhere. Sir, please. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for all your comments. Very insightful and informative in this interesting time. My name is Matt Anderson. I'm a U.S. Army officer, foreign area officer, War College class of 2014. My question is for Dr. Goodson and Dr. Bolin on U.S. policy and national interests. James Miskell, in his article on national interests, challenges the idea that interests must be clearly defined or that statesmen are able or motivated to define concrete national interests by the, thereby locking themselves into fixed policy decisions. Do you see a compelling national interest here with Syria? And do you attribute the evolving and squishy nature of US policy towards Syria as mere political survival? Or do you think the evolution of policy towards Syria and the Middle East in general has had a positive or negative impact on the ability of our senior leaders to pursue US national security interests? Well, and that, that, the, the, the latter part of that question is really open-ended. So that, the, let, let me go to the first part and then, and then punt the hard part to, uh, to Chris. <laughs> uh, Matt's in my seminar, so I know to punt the hard part to uh, um, I do see a compelling interest. The president's uh, articulation of, the, uh, of that interest, which is partly values-based, uh, as we were all discussing earlier and as we've discussed also, um, seems compelling to me, and it, it, for me, it really has to do with the the regional dynamic that uh, Dick Winslow was talking about. That th there's a there's a, a a real high level of likelihood. In fact, it's already underway that the Syrian civil war is going to spill over into the region, or is spilling over into the region, in very dangerous ways. I think that runs counter to uh, what the president has articulated as a core interest. To me, it's a compelling interest. I, I don't see it as necessarily a fixed interest, although I know our friends in Israel would like us to see it as a fixed interest, and, and it has been relatively fixed for a long time for the United States. Uh, the latter part of your question, it seems to me, is really open-ended and hard, and now I'm punning to you, Chris. Yeah, I'll probably. Uh, well, let me, I'll back. start with the easy one, too. I mean, I will say there is a natural tendency on the part of um, senior civilian leadership, not just politicians, but to clearly define the national interest up front, precisely because, as you mentioned, what that does is that constrains their options rather than opens up options. And uh, similar to the, you know, the arguments about uh, whether President Obama was well advised to identify up front a red line on use of chemical weapons. I mean, once you do that, that starts to take on a life of its own, and politicians are, and senior political leadership are, are really, they're all about changing the world and making it better. So they want to they wanna actually do, do more and productive and positive things. So there's a tendency to, uh, to launch in and actually do something. As I mentioned, ultimately they bear the moral, moral costs of global leadership too, so that's pretty important. Um, the one caution on kind of terms of has, you know, strategy really helped us or hurt us, I mean, over the long haul, I mean, you got to remember we've had what, relatively 30 years of stability, uh, relatively open access to the region's energy resources. So there's a lot of plus there. Um, is that, is, are those relationships with authoritarian regimes coming back to, to haunt us a little bit now? Yes, but... Um, but that's then, and now we've got now, and we've got to figure out how to move forward and take advantage of all these developments in the Arab Spring. And the last caution I would be, I mean, is in terms of a compelling national interest, you know, a forceful response to the use of chemical weapons doesn't have to be limited 
to military operations. I mean, there are plenty of other ways to make a response forceful, meaningful, embargoes, punishments, sanctions, indicting folks on war crimes. Um, so, you know, there are other tools in the kit bag, even though we have a natural tendency, I think, for our part, to focus rightly on the military pieces of things. Um, the sad reality is the other departments like state, agriculture, trade, commerce, don't have the planning capability we do in DOD to actually flush out those uses of instruments and national power, which is why I think it's really important you all use your time here. One of the things you ought to do is really familiarize yourself with the strengths and limits of diplomacy, of economic instruments of power, of the informational instruments of power, because you're going to be saddled with synchronizing all that stuff just because you're the only ones with the institutional capability to do it. Thanks, Chris. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was looking up a little bit further. I don't, I'll come back to you. I'm going to take one off the monitor, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. Several days ago, I listened to a one-hour interview that Charlie Rose did with Bashar al-Assad. Uh, an hour later, I heard the mainstream media report on that same interview. I barely recognized it. Uh, they obviously heard all kinds of things that he said that I didn't hear, and I listened to the entire hour interview. How much of a problem is that for making policy and then implementing policy when apparently the mainstream media in this country has its own ideas about policy? Yeah. Um on the media, I've also been playing cl close attention to the media, and um, I have a very mixed reaction. I saw a consultant for a major political party um, discussing the impact of a strike on, on uh, Syria, saying that um, we have to be very careful we don't send the wrong message to President Ahmadi Najad of Iran. Yeah, I said, well, well, yeah, President Eisenhower would be very upset if that happened. But, <laughs> um, uh, you, you know, so you have to wonder where they dig up some of these people. I saw something last night where they were talking about the chemical weapons that Bashar Assad had, and they were talking about he had sulfur. Sulfur isn't a chemical weapon. Sulfur mustard is, but they didn't know that, and they had, had sulfur up there. Um, I've seen that, and this is in The Economist, that the only chemical weapon attack by anybody after World War II, you know, forgetting about, you know, there were some of these in the 30s, Mussolini in Ethiopia, et cetera, but they said after World War II, was when Saddam attacked um, the Iranians and the Kurds with chemical weapons, which is patently not the only one. There's been a variety. I wrote an article in Comparative Strategy about the chemical weapons use in Yemen. So I think a couple of things. When you have this 24-hour news cycle and you have a lot of people that have to... Um, draw ratings, and the best way to draw ratings is to have people scream at each other on some of these shows, and they, they bring in a lot of the wrong people. And they bring in a lot of people whose knowledge of things are a mile wide and an inch deep. Now, you still get a lot of good news, I mean, in terms of good quality news, on places like the News Hour with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Jim Lehrer, or was Jim Lehrer, now it's, now it's Gwen Eiffel. And so there are places you can go, but yeah, it really is a buyer's beware market. And since the mainstream media hasn't paid a lot of attention to Syria and hasn't paid a lot of attention to, um, to uh, 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 chemical weapons, no zilch about chemical weapons, uh, it's, a tough, it's, it's a tough slog. And in general, television makes bigger mistakes than I see in the print media. I told you that one I saw in The Economist was a was a was a, was a Lulu, yeah, but let me. Let yeah. me I, yeah. I think I think you've answered the question, okay. and I think 
Look, the, the media reporting is variable. We all know that. So a prudent person, particularly a person who wants to be well-informed, should try and make sure you have as broad a range of sources as you, can, as you can access to understand the issues. Unfortunately, not everyone has the same deep interest as you may all do in understanding that, and, and that's the nature of, of how we deal. Now, I go on, Andy, because I'm going to the monitor, and the next question is for you. So I'm not trying to no, no, stop no, you, no. but I want to shift gears. The question for Dr. Terrell is, your Terrell, Terrell. Terrell, your description of the demographic mosaic of Syria seem to put all parties in religiously defined camps. What is the relationship between the religious leaders and those sects in the Assad regime? What is the feasibility of finding diplomatic solutions using religious leaders as arbiters? Please, let's take, if you can, in three minutes, and then I want to get back okay, to the yeah, question we'll wrap up. Three minutes, huh? Uh, it, uh, <laughs> it, it's a good question, and I don't usually do this, but I feel compelled in this instance to try to make my point. I'm going to tell you a Lebanese slash Syrian joke. I'll go very fast. It's got uh, a bunch of guys sitting together asking each other what their religious sect is. One guy says, I'm a Maronite Christian. Next guy says, I'm a Sunni Muslim. Next guy says, I'm a Shia Muslim. Third guy says, um, I'm an atheist. And they go, okay, you're an atheist. And they're all upset. And they're not upset because he's an atheist. They said, yeah, but are you a Christian atheist, a Muslim atheist, or a Sunni atheist? You know, so... <laughs> It's this kind of thing that religion in the Middle East defines your community and who you can trust and who you can't trust and who's the in-group, who's the out-group. It's not necessarily even predominant, predominantly about your relationship with a higher power or higher being or finding a more compelling explanation for the universe. It's who you are uh, as far as the people you can trust and the people that trust you. So that, that goes pretty deeply in the Middle East Assad, in terms of his relations with the different religious leaders, um, certainly he has very good relations, for the most part, with various Christian leaders. And as I say, a lot of the Christians are truly afraid of, of uh, an Islamist regime taking uh, over after Assad. And they don't have a lot of freedom under Assad, but at least they, uh, they don't have to worry about the kind of persecution that they fear would occur under an Islamist regime. On the other uh, groups, he certainly has his picture taken with the, you know, the patriarchs and, and such like that of the various religions. Um, and he's got, uh, he's got some ability to, uh, to bring them in and um, to, uh, to, try to, uh, to try to use them uh, as, as props, essentially. Now the, these people are staying away from him because they are flocking to the rebels if, if, if they're Sunni, and they know it's unhealthy to, 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 to uh, move too closely towards him. And so uh, his relationship isn't so good with those groups. And uh, the feasibility of finding a diplomatic solution using religious leaders as arbiters, um, I don't think that that's going to go too far, actually. I think right now that most of the actors in Syria see these things as a, as a zero-sum game. If I win, uh, you lose, and there's no win-win strategy that they tend to see under those circumstances, and until the political dynamic within Syria is redefined a little bit, uh, I, I'm not sure that there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, successful efforts at diplomacy by anybody to get these groups to lay down their weapons. Wonderful. Thank you, Andy. Sure. Sir. Yes, I'm Tom Diffenbach. Dr. Boland, you said, what if deterrence doesn't work? And you also said, once you're in, you're in. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, I mean, the, the issue of, you know, there's no guarantee, and there's never any guarantee, no matter which policy or strategic option you choose, there's never a guarantee of success, right? But in this case, um, if I were pushed to kind of look for an alternative to a military strike scenario, one of the cautions would be that, look, just because we strike once doesn't mean that's good. We hope it will deter Assad's future use, but if it weakens Assad to the point where he becomes desperate and he thinks his only means of survival is to use what he's got left of his chemical weapons reserves, then you've actually hastened the outcome you wanted to prevent, and then it becomes a question of then what? And that's kind of what I think, you know, General Dempsey was getting to in terms of thinking through 
the possible consequences and second and third order effects. So if Assad ups the ante, then what are we going to do? Likely we're going to up the ante, you know, as well. And, and that may well be the right response, but you at least need to think through those consequences. And that's kind of what I mean by, you know, once we get involved, it's the U.S. leading economic, military, social, cultural power in the world that's involved. And there's a tendency to want to finish that in a favorable way, which we should do. And if that means doing more, folks will do more. So that's just a, it's not a guaranteed outcome. Uh, President Obama in particular is trying to mitigate the risk of that. I think he acknowledged it in terms of his speech, but that's why he's saying, I'm not going to put boots on the ground. It's not going to be a long sustained air campaign. And he's acknowledging that risk and portraying to the people here are the breaks I've put on uh, my strategy to make sure we don't fall prey to that risk. Thanks, Chris. Um, we have two minutes. So I'll give you a question and I'll ask the responder to make the briefest of answers and then we'll wrap it up so we can keep things running on time. So, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Ilker Can from Turkey, from uh, Seminar 25. Uh, I have uh, one, more than one question. Uh, the first is... One, one question. You, you, no. You'll have chances in seminar for the next okay. two months to discuss all these <laughs> questions. I want to keep us on time. Okay. Uh, there is a Russian base, uh, and uh, there are advisors, uh, Russian advisors, and Iranian soldiers uh, in Syria, and they support a lot. Uh, and uh, the Syrian regime is uh, look like a family-owned company. And uh, if uh, something happens to uh, Assad, uh, do you have any assessment uh, who will change Assad, Bashar Assad? And uh, as a member of NATO, uh, is there a role for N NATO in it's Syria? That's already two questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Dick, I'm going to offer you the chance to have the last word on this. Okay, so which of those two do you want answered? <laughs> about, about a role for NATO or about who might succeed Assad? The first one. The first one. Uh, that is the great unknown for the, for the United States and every other <laughs> interested uh, international party to this because there are no obvious dominant groups among the opposition. You know, I, I can't name which opposition group is most likely uh, to end up in power if the opposition succeeds. And because of the opaqueness of the Assad regime, uh, if he were to die through any mechanism, uh, yet his regime, were, its supporters were to remain in power, uh, Again, that's, that's not predictable. So, so my answer to you, unfortunately, is that is a great unknown that we all need to think about what the answers might be. But at the present time, none of us can really answer it. Thanks. Well, I hope you won't leave here feeling that you want your money back because you didn't find an answer to the question what the U.S., what the United States should do in Syria. But I hope you leave here thinking, at least acknowledging that Four panelists here who think about these issues uh, very deeply are thinking about these types of things as they form their recommendation and their perspective on what the United States should do. We're fortunate because in the course of our work, we often use historical case studies to good effect. But I think for the next two months, given the nature of this issue in the timeline, we probably have this as a current issue that we can also use in seminar, in our work, to try and understand better the concepts and the broader strategies that we're discussing. So thank you for your attention, and please join me in thanking all the panelists. I, I definitely hear some of you, but you're right. The brother 